Uh, thank you, Bruce and Lloyd. So I begin feeling like I'm invited to speak after Demosthenes and Cicero. It's a challenging task. Uh, I'd also like uh, to note that the United States did, I believe, contribute to the Chief Justice's observation that uh, a Supreme Court is not infallible uh, because they're final, but vice versa. I believe that was borrowed from our Associate Justice Robert Jackson in a case called Brown versus Allen. So there was that nexus that we have into um, Nigerian jurisprudence. We're both common law countries, and I think in the United States as well, uh, it is recognized that a court, including our U.S. Supreme Court, has done uh, and reversed itself, vacated judgment that it found on reflection was an error. <clears throat> I want, however, to try to put in context what I think is a more dangerous and perilous element of this particular decision. Uh, because it's really, I think, it's nothing more than the tip of the iceberg. As uh, my colleagues have explained, uh, there is no way that a legitimate, impartial judge sitting on the Nigerian Supreme Court could have rendered its January 14th, 2020 decision, uh, awarding a victor in an election where the number of votes vastly exceeded the number of registered voters. And there are other logical, mathematical impossibilities. Uh, the Nigerian Supreme Court uh, justices know simple math. So you have to ask, well, why? You know, and what is the problem uh, that is surfaced in this particular decision in Emo State? Uh, and I think this goes back to what Lloyd mentioned, the danger that Nigeria now confronts of now having what James Madison called the very definition of tyranny, the combination of executive, legislative, and judicial power in one branch. Uh, we know simply from the way in which the Supreme Court Chief Justice was removed, the irregularity of appointing the justices that would sit in this particular case, uh, the obvious wrong and fraud that the court permitted to be exercised against itself, that there was politics afoot. Uh, this is not law. Uh, this is uh, what is called a decision uh, based upon a jumble of calculations fueled by political ambition, namely control of uh, the southern states, perhaps in preparation of the 2023 elections, because if you have your governor installed, you have control over the election machinery and give you an advantage. Now, why is this so dangerous? to have the judicial branch compromised in the, perhaps the most important decision that a self-governing country makes, who is to be elected, who will govern them. Because it is elections, the right to vote and have it honored, that's preservative of all other rights. It's the only way where you can have a peaceful opportunity to redress grievances by electing persons that you trust and respect to honor your wishes, the wishes of the majority, all those who are citizens of Nigeria. I again underscore, it is the peaceful avenue of redress of grievances. What happens when that peaceful avenue is cut off? That citizens believe ballot box doesn't mean anything. What is the only alternative at that point? If it's not the ballot box, we know what that means. Uh, it means resort to some other alternate method of having your will, whether it's strife, whether it's violence, lawlessness, or something of that sort. And we've had it in the United States ourselves uh, when we had huge disputes over slavery in the territories. Years ago, we had uh, bloody Kansas when elections between the abolitionists and the pro-slavery uh, citizens were clearly fraudulent and uh, done through force and violence. We ended up having a semi-civil war in Kansas for years. The last thing Nigeria needs is a second edition of the 67-70 war in Biafra. But what are the alternatives? Um, 
especially in a country like Nigeria, where the powers of government are so critical to the lives of so many. It dominates the economy. It has huge force by which they can intimidate and control lives. All the more important that the rulers then, when they're entrusted with powers that are very broad, are truly the representatives of the people who voted freely and without coercion and had the votes counted. So this is why I believe that in part uh, the danger is so great. Uh, what will happen uh, in af the aftermath if this deci decision remains undisturbed? If you are a politician in Nigeria, you can see, well, if this happens in the Emo state, why not in others? Won't it transmit and infect the country faster than the coronavirus, right? It'll just go everywhere. Why should you have to bother going and undertaking the serious task of winning votes by persuasion if you can just summon votes into being out of thin air? And moreover, what also is very, very disturbing is that the fraud was so blatant. Those who perpetrated it must have had confidence that nothing was going to happen. You would at least do, try to be a little more sophisticated, you know, than to conceal the manipulation. You know, maybe have one or two vote difference where maybe a stenographic error could explain the discrepancy. 120,000? Impossible. Um, especially in add to just the numerical irregularities, the fact that how could you have an emo state, the PDP wins all of the parliamentary seats and loses the governorship. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So the fact that this was done so blatantly is an earmark on those who ought to be concerned about the fraud, including the president. The executive officials uh, must have communicated in some way or other to the justices, don't worry. No matter what you do, nothing's going to happen. We control the criminal justice system. We control the money, which I say is quite disturbing. Uh, now, what is the United States' interest involved? Uh, we clearly respect the sovereignty of Nigeria as we respect the sovereignty of all countries. Uh, it is not for us to dictate and to lecture Nigerians on how to run their country. Uh, or, now, that's different, however, I think, from as a nation that's built on the premise that we, the people, are the ultimate sovereigns. We do give our sympathy, our hearts, to those who fight for freedom and independence abroad, even if we don't necessarily resort to coercion. That's just where our sympathies are. But in the United States, we have something even more at stake. And that is we do have interests uh, in the stability and peace in West Africa. Uh, we know that chaos, uh, anarchy, invites terrorism, international terrorism. Boko Haram gets stronger. We don't know what other insurrections uh, might be ignited uh, when the people feel there isn't any politics anymore. It's all the guns. You can't go to the ballot box. And even if you cast your ballot, they'll invent some votes that will cast, make yours worthless, meaningless. So the United States does have a bona fide interest in seeing that the Nigerian constitution, uh, that the rule of law is honored under their own precepts. Um, what was so flagrant is not even international standards being violated, which they were. But this Nigerian constitution is being flouted. It's turned into a parchment barrier. It doesn't mean anything. And if you can flout the Nigerian constitution when it comes to electing officials, what other parts can you flout with impunity? There's nothing special that leaps out in like neon sign that says, oh, this is the one that you can flout with impunity, but the others you have to obey. Why do you, should you have to obey any part of the constitution? If you white out any race one, as long as you have the guns and the AK-47s, do whatever you want. 
you're back to a pre-constitutional dispensation that is quite worrying, if not frightening. Now, the United States also, because we have uh, assistance to Nigeria uh, in counterterrorism efforts, we have economic investments there. We have an interest in the stability of oil flows uh, in seeing Nigeria succeed as a nation, uh, not lecturing them, uh, but urging uh, what we call uh, putting sunshine on the issue. Uh, one of our very eloquent Supreme Court justices, Louis Brandeis, once said, sunshine is said to be the best of disinfectants, the electric light, the most efficient policeman. And simply your presence here today, the fact that the Supreme Court and Nigeria knows other people are looking, has at least some deterrent effect. It's not going to escape public scrutiny, uh, even if it doesn't result in an immediate reversal. Doesn't mean down the road justice will ultimately prevail. You know, the world will not end tomorrow or the next day. Uh, and there have been instances and, uh, under international law uh, where judges themselves for flagrant violations have been held accountable. And there's no reason why that wouldn't be a possibility here. Uh, we wouldn't encourage that, uh, but that certainly is something that is on the table. Uh, the uh, United States, uh, I believe, uh, has an interest in seeing uh, the rule of law uh, abided and even encouraging, but not demanding, uh, that there, in fact, be international uh, investigation or examination of this particular issue uh, if this is not cured. And that is not an infringement on sovereignty. Uh, there are oftentimes cases where a particular government finding its own resources and capabilities insufficient to detect wrongdoing will invite foreign, foreign investigators, foreign observers. Uh, Mexico has often invited the United States to help in some of their counter-drug, counter-gang problem. Uh, recently, even in uh, Iran, they invited in outside investigators, France, to determine who and how this civilian plane was shot down in the aftermath of the assassination of General Soleimani. Um, in Lebanon, when the prime minister was assassinated, uh, an international body was invited in to investigate who were the culprits. In Sri Lanka, I know I was working there, and there are many, many disappearances, thousands of Tamils, and the International Commission of Jurists was invited to make a report. Uh, these are not infringements on sovereignty, it's simply an acceptance by the incumbent government. We need, because we have, we are politically confronting conflicts of interest, we need those who will come in and provide confidence in the citizenry that the alleged wrongdoing has been adequately and fairly examined, tested, and decided. Uh, and I think this is something uh, that surely uh, Nigeria ought to consider. Uh, and it would be following what many, many other countries have done. I think, as, uh, as my fellows have pointed out, the executive branch here obviously has a conflict of interest. Their APC, the, US, the, the Supreme Court of Nigeria's APC, the winner uh, of the alleged winner is APC. Uh, it's very difficult to believe you will come up with an impartial uh, investigation that would be accepted as legitimate uh, by the people of Nigeria. And that's obviously the reason why you have uh, uh, law, is to ensure that the decisions are accepted and voluntarily complied with, that you don't need the bayonet to enforce the orders. It's felt that this is done with a proper process, you accept it, and you work through peaceful channels and avenues of redress. Uh, we think that um, it is very, very important uh, for the United States to take the lead in casting sunshine on the issue. We want to underscore the United States is not here to lecture. We're not here to bully. We're not here to try to 
make uh, Nigeria an appendage of the United States. We're here as a friend to encourage the evolution of Nigeria's fledgling democracy. And again, it's relatively short-lived. It really began uh, in 1999 with a military dictatorship ordained constitution, which at least turned some power over to the civilian sector. Uh, the last thing Nigeria needs is retrogression uh, to the days that harken back to the Civil War. But those are the large issues, I think, that are important to understand in the context of this particular flagrant fraud. It's not just this election, bad enough as it is, but it portends the descent of Nigeria into a failed state. Thank you.